From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from New York. From Bloomberg's world headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to a special extended edition of Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. It's election night in America, the country deciding whether Donald Trump or Kamala Harris will be the next president of the United States and who will control both chambers of Congress. The first polls begin to close just one hour from now. And as we await results, we'll be joined by former Republican Senator Pat Toomey and Tara Setmayer of the Seneca Project, alongside Bloomberg politics contributors Rick Davis and We'll also bring you an important conversation with Bloomberg's David Weston and the former Secretary of the Treasury, Larry Summers. And we've got live coverage from our reporters on the ground at the campaign's election night headquarters and in the most critical battleground states that we'll be tracking for the next many hours. Thanks for being with us on this election night as we now turn to our reporters in the field and joining us from Howard University in Washington, D.C., where we will find the Democratic nominee later tonight is Bloomberg's Akela Gardner. Hi, Akela. Hey, Joe and Kaylee. So we are on the campus of Howard University, which in many ways is where it's all started for Vice President Harris. She ran her first ever campaign here as freshman class representative of the Liberal Arts College. And she also held her first event here when she first ran for president in 2019. And this cycle, she has used the campus to prepare for her first and only presidential debate against Donald Trump. She also used it to prepare for her DNC speech. And tonight, this is where possibly her campaign ends. We still do not have remarks on the schedule for Vice President Harris, but this will be a really a test tonight of whether her whirlwind campaign of only 107 days will be successful. And she says she will be able to turn the page on an heir of Donald Trump, who has been, as we know, in the public spotlight for almost a decade. All right, Bloomberg's Kayla Gardner live from Howard University in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And joining us now from where Donald Trump will be spending his evening, West Palm Beach, Florida, is Bloomberg's Felipe Marquez. Felipe, what's the feeling like in the Sunshine State? Thank you. So I'm here and I'm here at West Palm Beach Convention Center and right behind me is the stage where we'll see Donald Trump later tonight. Things are still pretty slow around here. People are still trickling in at 5 p.m. But Trump said there will be thousands of supporters gathered here to greet him when he arrives later this evening. Trump voted here in West Trump voted here in Palm Beach earlier today. And then he went to stayed in Mar-a-Lago, where he watched election results coming in with his family and close friends. After voting, he said he has the upper hand in the election and that this is probably the last time he will ever run. There are a couple of things you should watch out for here tonight. We should probably see some key Trump advisors, including North Dakota Governor Doug Bergen and his top, one of his top economic advisors, Scott Message. We should also see a spectacle. I mean, just minutes ago, there was an operatic singer right behind me rehearsing enthusiastically a version of Hallelujah. One thing that I would also note is this is a homecoming of sorts for Trump. Palm Beach has become a, whole, a nerve center for the GOP and for the MAGA movement Trump founded. All right, Felipe, thank you. Bloomberg's Felipe Marquet with the roadmap from West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. And we turn now to Detroit, Michigan, of course, as critical as any spot on the map, specifically in the Blue Wall. Bloomberg's Romaine Bostic is on the ground tonight. Hi, Romaine. Yeah, there's a big reason why both candidates spent so much time in the state of Michigan, both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, having at least 50 separate events over the last few months, as many as 90 events if you count some of their surrogates going back to February. They see the potential to win this state, a state that is certainly a swing state to the fullest. Only about one percentage point in the major polls separates Donald Trump and Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket. And there are even more competitive races down ballot. A key Senate race between uh, Alyssa Slotkin uh, versus Mike Rogers, as well as two open congressional House seats that are up for grabs. It could help determine the complexion of both the House and the Senate when the new Congress is sworn in in January. I did have a chance to catch up with uh, uh, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson a little bit earlier. She said that so far the election day has gone smooth. She expects that the tally of counting will go though into the night and though she expects that we will have formal results 
in Michigan sometime on Wednesday afternoon. And while, of course, there are a lot of serious issues being debated here in this election, it's not all serious business, Joe and Kaylee. In fact, one of the hottest items out here right now, one of the biggest souvenirs, are those I voted stickers, you know, kind of those boring <laughs> stickers with the American flag. Mm -hmm. Well, Michigan had a contest where they invited people to come up with their own designs for I voted stickers. Nine designs won, and they are creative to be sure. I'm not <laughs> sure how well you can see this, but one of the winners <laughs> is right at the top. This is Joyce, a middle schooler from Gross Point, Michigan. This is a depiction of a werewolf ripping off his shirt Hulkamania style with I voted in the background. Fantastic. This is the kind of color we need on election it. night. Bloomberg's Romaine Bostic reporting live from Detroit. Thank you so much. And now we turn to Raleigh, North Carolina, where we find Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. Anna, it's not just about the presidential race where you are, but also a key gubernatorial one. That's right. We've been to two polling places here in North Carolina, one in Democratic-leaning Raleigh and one in Clayton, a small town uh, in the next county over in a much more rural area. And honestly, it's been a mixed bag of both. We've seen people who are very passionate for Donald Trump, people who are very passionate for Kamala Harris, and also a lot of people who are just exasperated. They have been inundated with text messages and political ads. Everyone is just ready for it to be over, whether or not they are eagerly awaiting the results or uh, are less invested in, in the the outcome, everyone's just ready for it to be over. You know, counties like Johnston County, where we were earlier today, is one of those ring counties around uh, uh, metro areas that really will determine who wins North Carolina. Um, they have gotten an influx of people since the last presidential election, and we will see today whether or not they are voting more like the rural counties they used to be or more like the suburban counties that they're quickly becoming. Great. Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. Thank you so much, Anna, in North Carolina. As we reach now for the big prize tonight, Pennsylvania, and in Philadelphia is Bloomberg's David Gura. David, they just started counting the early ballots this morning. This could be a long wait. Could be a long wait. I suspect many Pennsylvanians would sympathize with the North Carolinians that Anna was mentioning just a moment ago. They, too, have been inundated by ads and outreach over the course of these last uh, many months. And I got a lot of good counsel to take a nap this afternoon to rest up for, for a long night ahead, of course. I was on the phone. I was calling local offices and texting with them as well just to see what turnout has been like across this state. And to a T, everyone told me that the lines have been long. The turnout has been extraordinary. Uh, and I should say, there have not been many problems at those polling places across this, across this state in places like Monroe County and Lackawanna County. I do want to note there have been a few irregularities, if you can call them that. There were some delays in a couple places in this state, and the courts have intervened here to extend voting in a couple of those places in Lucerne County, which is outside of Scranton. At one particular polling place, there was a delay this morning. A judge has said it can stay open now until 930, so an hour and a half later uh, than scheduled, and folks can cast provisional ballots there uh, if they want to or need to. Another place is Cambria County. That is outside of Pittsburgh in this state. Some delays there this morning as well. There's a two-hour extension there. Again, what voters will be able to do at those places is cast provisional ballots. Those will not be counted by law until Friday of this week. But, Joe, you mentioned the process that has been underway here. Early voting in this state happens by mail-in ballots. Folks got them weeks ago, filled them out, returned them via U.S. Postal Service or brought them to their local offices. Uh, they waited there. They were cured. They couldn't be opened until today. Uh, I checked in with Allegheny County, another big county in this state. Uh, they were making their way through those envelopes pretty quickly this morning. Between 8 and 9 o'clock, they'd opened more than 100,000 of them. So that process underway here, uh, and each of these counties assuring me that as they get votes, we're going to see updates on these county-by-county county sites just indicating sort of what that unofficial tally is going to be here in Pennsylvania. And just quickly, David, this is, of course, also a state which has a critical Senate race, the incumbent Bob Casey against Dave McCormick, a former Bridgewater executive. Is there a sense that that Senate decision, whatever party wins, is likely to also be the case of the party that wins the presidential vote there. There is that sense, but I just want to underline how important this Senate race is. Yes, the path to the presidency historically has been one that runs through Pennsylvania. This is a, a Senate seat that could determine the balance of power in the United States Senate. And Bob Casey, the incumbent Democrat, has been in the Senate uh, for three terms now. He's going for his fourth. He's uh, the son of a two-time governor of this state. Dave McCormick has run for Senate before in a, in a primary against Mehmet Oz. He lost that primary, didn't get to run the sort of general election for that Senate seat. So he's running again, trying to make a go of it. And we've seen here in recent weeks him narrowing, uh, coming a little bit closer to, to Bob Casey in that poll. So that's something we're going to be watching very closely here. And as you say, could be really pivotal here uh, as, as the night unfolds.
All right, Bloomberg's David Gura reporting live from Philadelphia. Thank you so much. And we want to keep the focus on Pennsylvania and its 19 electoral votes as Harris and Trump both projected confidence of victory in the swing state when they spoke there last night. Oh, it's good to be back in the city of brotherly love. Where the foundation of our democracy was forged. Just one more day in the most consequential election of our lifetime, and the momentum is on our side. I think we're going to have a big day, but you have to go. Forget about the others. It doesn't matter. You have to go and vote. We win this state. It's over. We win the Commonwealth. We're going to win the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And joining us now is someone who knows the state of Pennsylvania incredibly well. He used to represent the state in the U.S. Senate. Republican Senator Pat Toomey is joining us live here from our global headquarters in New York on Bloomberg TV and radio. Senator, thank you for being here. Thanks we have spent me. all day, we have spent weeks and months talking about this election <laughs> yeah. being too close to call, especially in states like Pennsylvania. Do you have a gut feeling about tonight? Well, uh, you know, if you look at the polling, it, you, you don't know what to conclude, right? The polling has a race dead even. But the question is, have the pollsters correctly calibrated for their previous errors? Mm. Have they over-calibrated, under-calibrated? We won't know until the election actually takes place. There's an actual data point that I think might be a little bit instructive, but it's certainly not this positive. And that is two, actually. One is the huge shift in registered voters from being registered as Democrats to being registered as Republicans. In 2016, when I ran for re-election, when Donald Trump was elected, um, the Democrats had a, a, almost a million vote advantage over Republicans in just the count of registered voters. Um, as of today, that number is about 400,000. It's a huge move. Second, in 2020, very few Republicans voted by mail mm -hmm. or voted early at all. It was an election day operation yep. for Republicans. This time, there's a lot of Republicans who have voted by mail, and we, we can track that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible that these are all Republicans who are going to vote on election day anyway, and so there's no net change. But I think it's more likely that there's a pickup in some votes. So with all that said, uh, if I had to bet, I'd probably bet on... Uh, on Trump to carry Pennsylvania, but it would yep. be with a very low level of confidence. Wow. I can't imagine your thoughts seeing the Democratic nominee on the Rocky Steps last evening, but I just yeah. wonder if you can speak to the state as a whole. What is it about Pennsylvania? To Kaylee's point, we've been talking about uh, the state for months and months. It yeah. is the big prize tonight after the states that have already gone blue and red. You've got two cities, yeah. you've got a massive rural area in between, right. and it's confounding every campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, it just, it, so first of all, it, it's a fantastic state, right? It's a big state, right? Th but just about 13 million people. Mm -hmm. It's a microcosm of America when you think about it. Yeah. Philadelphia is really a big northeastern city. Pittsburgh is a good sized Midwestern city. Uh -huh. um, not many states span the Northeast and the Midwest. Nice. And as you point out, there's a tremendous amount of rural and small towns and small cities. But you managed to thread this big needle. <laughs> um, you know, it's very, very narrowly divided and almost exactly even. And so a, a very slight advantage uh, makes the difference. That's just the nature. And it's really typically decided now in the suburbs, mm -hmm. right? That's where the swing voters reside in Pennsylvania. The cities are pretty predictable. The rural areas are pretty predictable. The suburbs are much harder. I think Dave McCormick is likely to do quite well in the big suburbs, hmm. suburbs throughout the state. I, I think, frankly, he goes in um, with a slight edge in this race. Um, but but it's it's very hard to say. We'll we'll see in a, uh, maybe a day or so. <laughs> well, you bring us to an important yeah. point, which is that this is not just about the presidential election. This right. is about the majority in the Senate, which only requires two net pickups for Republicans to flip right. the chamber. How much, though, does the side of the majority matter. What yeah. difference yeah. would a Dave McCormick, in addition to West Virginia and Montana, which yeah. are presumed to flip Republican, make? That's right. So with West Virginia and Montana, it's 51 Republicans, 49 mm -hmm. uh, Democrats. And any single Republican departing from the consensus of the party on a given vote means legislation fails. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a dangerous dynamic because you, you make 51 kings, right? <laughs> <Who> can, <laughs> and that can be very challenging. So that's one sort of operationally. But the other thing we should recognize is, I hate to say this, don't, don't yell at me, but we're only two years away from the next election cycle. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, several Republican senators 
could be in tough re-election battles. Yeah. Tom Tillis in North Carolina, yeah. Susan Collins in Maine. So um, if Donald Trump wins, then you would expect that midterm election to be rough sledding for Republicans. And so you'd like to go into it with a few seats to spare. Sure. Um, so both from an operational point of view, but also from a political point of view down the road, it would be very, very helpful for Republicans to have more than just 51. Geography for our viewers and listeners to watch tonight. You've pointed to Erie, I believe, in Northampton yeah. counties. What's got yeah. your focus this evening? Um, those are counties that voted for Trump in 16, mm -hmm. flipped in 2020. Um, Northampton County is, is a big swing county. That's in the, the sort of the south, but in the eastern part of the state. Mm -hmm. Erie, of course, the northwest corner. I'd also keep an eye on some of the big suburban counties around Philadelphia, especially Bucks, Montgomery. Um, they are very likely to go with the Democratic nominees in both of the top two uh, races, mm -hmm. but the margin matters a lot. If, if uh, Trump and McCormick can keep those big suburban counties close, it, uh, it bodes well for them for the night. We're out of time. Can David McCormick win without Donald Trump? Yeah, he can. Yeah. I think he can outperform Donald Trump because he'll be more appealing to moment. suburban voters than, than Trump. Really glad you could spend some time with us. At the Happy desk. to be here. Thanks Thank for you, having Senator. me. Of course, Pat Toomey, the former Republican senator of Pennsylvania on this election night. Coming up, we'll be joined by Tara Setmayer of the Seneca Project next on this special election edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. It's women, it's college educated, it's younger people, it's older people as well. It's our, the incidence of voting if you're age 64 and over is like 94%. That's a really big number and she does very well with older Iowans. Holster and Selzer, the president of Selzer and Company, shook the campaign trail over the weekend with her latest survey speaking there about this key group lining up for the candidates here. And we're joined in a special edition here, our election night edition of Balance of Power by Tara Setmayer, CEO of the Seneca Project. Tara, it's great to have you back with us. The narrative, if there is a good one for Kamala Harris is, older women are breaking, 65 and older in her direction, that it's created late momentum for her. Is it real? It's absolutely real. And we're seeing this across the board, particularly in the battleground states where women are outpacing men considerably in early voting. And women already have a higher propensity of voting, particularly older women. So um, that bodes well for Kamala Harris, which is why it was a bit confusing that the Trump campaign was zeroing in so much on men, which are there, and younger men, which are just lower propensity voters. But um, when the AARP poll came out a couple weeks ago showing that women over 50 were leaning toward Kamala Harris in ways that we had not seen before, that to me indicated that there was momentum there. And um, given the rate that that demographic votes, that it looked to me like things were starting to come back around and uh, give momentum to, to Kamala Harris. Well, I guess it becomes a question of why, what the issue is that's driving that. Earlier today, we spoke with Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, and this is what he had to say about what's motivating women to get out the vote. It uh, motivates not just women to vote for Kamala, but it, a lot of men are joining in the ranks. And I see it with younger voters, too. They look at the actual cases of these women facing miscarriages, trying to find competent physicians in states where there are criminal penalties being threatened, uh, and they understand that they don't want to be in that position. It doesn't sound like America to them, and it doesn't sound like it to me either. He's, of course, Tara, talking about the issue of abortion, which is literally on the ballot in 10 states today. Are we underestimating the impact of that? Absolutely. Well, we're not. The Seneca Project, uh, we, we recognize the importance of reproductive rights and rights being taken away from women very early on. That's why we started it, because we knew that that would transcend party lines. And 2022 was an indication of where you saw women coming out in droves and in red states where abortion was on the ballot. So Republican women 
would like to have bodily autonomy also. And now that we've seen the fallout from it, you have women like Liz Cheney out on the campaign trail giving a permission structure to those women as someone who she says admittedly, listen, I'm pro-life, but this has gone too far. And we've heard the horrific stories of women losing their lives or losing their fertility or almost losing their lives because of these draconian abortion bans. So it becomes real for people. And then for the men who are out there advocating on behalf of their wives and of their, you know, their daughters or their sisters, kudos to them as well, because they see how it impacts their lives also. So the combination of all of these things, I think women have had enough. They don't want to see women going back in time to a time when women were second class citizens, which I think is another motivating factor for women who are over uh, 65, because they lived through a time when they didn't, they couldn't open their own bank accounts, where they could, they had to get permission from their husbands to um, have medical care. I mean, all of these things, they remember that. And they're saying, hell no, we're not going back there. And we don't want that for our daughters or granddaughters. And this is partly why Tara is a former Republican, we should note for our audience. Uh, Tara, the polls are tied though. Are they not able to capture this sentiment? Well, you know, we all have been uh, a little cynical about polls, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and the way po modern day polling re really hasn't quite caught up all the way to technology. People don't answer their phones anymore. Yeah. And so we really don't know. But what I think and what I think we're seeing here is that you're undercounting the vote for women who don't want to admit that they're voting against their husbands. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Kamala Harris campaign le leaned into the idea of no one has to know who you voted for. The Seneca Project, we did that when we first launched. We said, listen, nobody has to know. It's one of the last few places where women have privacy is the ballot box. And that became an actual campaign issue. Because you have these, these men and they're so rabidly pro-Trump, these women have to feel like, listen, We'll say whatever we need to to get along in, with our husbands or in our community, but we know in our hearts we need to cast this ballot for Kamala and cast it, cast it for us and our future generations because our lives are literally on the line and our rights are on the line. So I think there is an undercount here. And all of these Republican women, like the Nikki Haley voter type, type voters, um, they do not want Donald Trump. And so this is what we're going to see. I think ultimately women are the ones who are going to save this country from the illiberalism of MAGA and win this election for Kamala Harris. Well, and she hasn't really talked about it at all, frankly, on the campaign trail, Tara. But if she wins tonight, she would be making history, a woman elected president of the United States of America and a woman of color at that. Since she isn't talking about it, can you? What would that mean? I mean, it's pretty remarkable. And I have to say that I've had a lot of pivot points throughout this election cycle where I've gotten very emotional <laughs> about a lot of things because of what is at stake and how monumental the moment we we're in really is. Uh, I'm a biracial woman, a uh, woman of color, and I'm looking at everything, uh, the moment that we're in in this country and what that means for little girls who look like me. The country is becoming more and more diverse. And I know that the, the Kamala Harris campaign made it a point not to lean so much into that the way Hillary Clinton did, but she didn't have to because so many women understand the assignment. And there's organizations like mine that are doing it for them. We put out a closing ad called American Girl. And to me, it's really more than an ad, it's an anthem for women because it shows the arc of the struggles that women have had to fight in this country for equality and for our rights. And it's something that every woman can relate to, that it's so hard to be an American girl, but yet we still love our country. And this is the greatest country in the world. And we've had to stand up and carry this country on our shoulders when they needed us in the past, even when the country didn't love us back equally, but we're willing to do it again because of love of country. And that has really resonated with millions and millions of women because together in solidarity in our experiences as women, we understand what's at stake and what, what this means in this moment. And it is pretty historic. Tara, we only have a minute left here. I, I just wonder your thoughts on the contrasting closing arguments from these two presidential candidates. You were with Kamala Harris last evening when the likes of Lady Gaga and Ricky Martin were there to, to play her out uh, at the end of this campaign. Does the impact of celebrity actually have an impact? 
I think it does culturally and getting out the vote. It, it's a, a feeling of being a part of something bigger than yourself. So when you have those types of mega iconic celebrities yeah. coming and lending their time to support Kamala Harris and promote the message of freedom mm. and democracy and women's rights, uh, it, it says something. And so um, I think that for the get out the vote and for a feeling of optimism, it was phenomenal. And it was really quite an honor to be there and experience that. All right, Tara Setmayer, CEO of the Seneca Project, thank you for joining us on this special extended edition of Balance of Power on Election Night. We have much more ahead, including a conversation with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers on Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special election edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines at World Headquarters in New York. As we turn now to an important conversation, I've said it more than once today, we are throwing the best of Bloomberg at this election coverage. And of course, that includes our colleague, Bloomberg's Wall Street Week anchor, David Weston, who joins us now for a special conversation with Larry Summers, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week contributor. David? Yeah, Joe, thank you very much, Chris. That is the very best of Bloomberg, is Larry Summers, who is our special contributor on Wall Street Week, and of course, long identical with Harvard. We're on the edge of the Harvard campus right here in Cambridge. Larry, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Uh, it's election day, election night. What's on your mind? I'm nervous and watching like uh, everybody else. No one knows what's going to happen. It's f foolish to try to predict. I'm struck that uh, Kamala Harris, I think, has had a very good week. Her at the Lincoln Memorial was a very different thing than Donald Trump at Madison Square Garden. The vibes are pretty clearly moving one way. Women have turned out on an epic scale. I'm told the exit polls are saying democracy is the primary issue. So I have a feeling that there may be a fair-sized turn in her direction, but look, we'll know the answer in a few hours and no one can really uh, no, so we'll just have to we'll just have to see. But who's ever the next president, they are going to have quite a difficult and challenging inbox on the economy. Well, that's what I want to talk about because time will tell. We'll see how much time it is is required to tell. But we'll know sooner or later whether it's Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, whoever it is, when they walk into the Oval Office, what in terms of economics will they have on their desk? Look, the positive thing they're going to have is that the American economy has been epically strong in a structural sense throughout the 21st century. We've grown far more rapidly than Europe, far more rapidly than uh, Japan. China is really having a lot of trouble. The American economy and American companies' capacity to deal with technology is really quite extraordinary and is a huge source of strength for our country. And that is an enormous asset. And we're going to talk about all the problems, but I'd rather be playing the hand of the United States than the hand of any other country. That said, just because things are going your way doesn't mean there aren't huge challenges. We have a huge national security challenge in a way we have not since the end of the Cold War. The combined axis of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea is a threat to our long-run security interests, the likes of which we have not seen probably in two generations. And the best way to respond to that is with economic strength. And that starts from a painful question. How long can the world's greatest debtor remain the world's greatest power. And we do not have a national debt and deficit situation that is currently on a sustainable basis. There is no way that you can debate whether we go three years, whether we go five years, whether we go one year, whether we go 15 years. But there is no argument that the current path is likely to be sustainable. And that means that we need some very difficult adjustments. Those adjustments are not going to come, given the security environment 
from cutting national defense. I think it's politically extremely difficult. And in a world where the top Social Security benefit is for an individual forty or $45,000, I don't think it's especially attractive to think about cutting Social Security benefits as a response. So we are going to need to raise revenue as a, a country. And that's why the most important thing that the President of the United States is going to deal with on the economy in 2025 is going to be the tax system and is going to be all those provisions that Donald Trump put in place that are scheduled uh, to expire. And how we deal with it and whether we're able to raise revenue on a substantial scale to start putting the deficit on a healthy path, that's probably going to be the most important uh, issue for the new president. Beyond that, uh, they've got to keep things going in a way that maintains confidence. I'm hugely troubled by what candidate Trump has said about he's going to advise and guide the Federal Reserve System. We've had a lot of history with presidents telling the Fed what to do, and none of it is happy. In the end, it leads to higher interest rates because the Fed doesn't listen that much, and so short rates don't change, and the market does listen, and so long rates go up. I've been disturbed by things I've heard about trashing the dollar and hoping that the dollar goes down. There's a lot of restiveness out there with respect to the dollar. I don't think there's a viable alternative to the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And I think we're going to maintain that competitive advantage. But gosh, we can't maintain it if our goal becomes to reduce the value of the dollar. So doing something about the deficit, being macroeconomically responsible. And then here's the big thing being a country that can get things done. We used to be a country that could build highways. It costs three times as much now per mile of highways as it did 40 or 50 years ago, even after controlling for inflation. Projects that we used to do quickly now take huge, long periods of time. We have got to be a country, again, that can get things done. That means looking at excesses of regulation. That also means making sure that there's a predictable environment uh, for business. And so I hope the new president is going to focus on these questions of making it possible to do things quickly. Look, we've got a huge revolution coming, David, in terms of what artificial intelligence can do, what it can do to support workers to increase their uh, productivity. But that's going to require energy. It's going to require immense amounts of electricity. And that electricity is going to have to be transmitted from one place to another. And we're going to have to be a country that can build transmission lines, that can actually take decisions and in the length of time it took to fight World War II, three and a half years, actually build transmission, transmission lines. So that set of issues around being able to get things done is, I think, really going to be crucial for who's ever the next president. So let me go back to some of those very important points and start with the debt and the deficit. It does strike me that uh, you think that is really an important thing to address, and yet neither of these two candidates, whoever ends up being president, really has come up with a plan for dealing with that. To be sure, the analysis suggests that a Kamala Harris as president would dig the hole a little less fast, but would still be digging a hole. She'd still, she'd still extend some of the Trump tax cuts. Uh, so do, does the next president, whoever it is, whichever candidate it is, do they have the support of the American people to make some of those tough decisions that you talk about, particularly with a Congress that may be resisting? The support of the American people depends on how they're led. And it's going to be an important part of the task of the next president to educate uh, the public, to identify crucial challenges, not just to our prosperity, but to our security, and get people to support 
the actions that are necessary. No, David, uh, I don't think that consensus has been built during the presidential campaign, but I hope it will be built uh, over time. And sooner or later, I don't know which it is. There are people who think it's really very imminent. They might be right. I'm not sure. Sooner or later, the bond market's going to do some of the educating. And when interest rates spike, that will be a moment that will change many people's views, many people's sense of urgency around these deficit issues. And so my guess is that we're going to probably be in a situation where, once again, in a democracy, fear does the work of reason. And so we'll get a moment when the interest rates spike, and that will drive more constructive action. It would be better if we could prevent it but, and solve the problem before the problem makes itself manifest, but that's not going to uh, be easy. And we have had some rumblings in the gilt markets with respect to some of the fiscal steps taken over the UK that might indicate that it may be a little bit shaky here. How do you position yourself to deal with that fear that you talk about when, in fact, a crisis comes, if there's a debt crisis? I think you need to start by emphasizing that uh, our debt is unsustainable, that an important part of the national strategy has to be making it sustainable, that some of making it sustainable is accelerating the rate of economic growth, because the faster you're growing, the more debt you can afford, and the more tax revenue the government takes. But you can't solve the whole problem just by accelerating growth. And so people are going to have to accept that there are changes that are going to be necessary. My own instinct is that most of those are going to need to be on uh, the revenue side. And there's plenty of room for raising uh, revenue. You look at the tremendous sums of money that are passed in estates that almost completely avoid estate taxation. And there's something important uh, to do there. Uh, I think President Trump made a serious, and the Congress made a serious policy error when they cut the corporate tax rate all the way down to 21 percent. That's less than the Business Roundtable was asking for at uh, that time. I think we should be reversing some of those uh, tax increase, tax cuts. There's room to raise revenue from, and that's where it should start, from those at the very top of the income distribution. But I think, ultimately, we may need to do more than that. We may need to raise revenue to finance Social Security and Medicare more fully, given that the burdens of those programs are going up as people live longer and a larger fraction of our population is aged. One of the things that has been in this campaign is growth. And to some extent, the extent to which regulation, excessive regulation, may be impeding the growth that we otherwise would have. Kamala Harris has not been outspoken about deregulation at all, whereas Donald Trump has. Is she going to change her position if she becomes president? I'm not going to speak for uh, anybody except uh, myself. Look, I don't think the right way to frame this is regulation or no regulation. I think the right way to frame this is smart regulation. And I think we've had a lot of regulation that hasn't been smart, that has chilled things in quite dangerous um, ways. I think that we're less energy secure than we would be if we would had more appropriate regulatory policies. I think with this huge surge in electricity demand that we're going to have, we have to find ways of reducing regulation so that we can site power plants and so that we can transmit electricity more effectively than we can. There are real issues about monopoly. There are important issues about monopoly, and we need to have strong enforcement of the antitrust law. But do we really need for more than half of the Fortune 500 by value to be subject to antitrust investigation? I doubt it. 
at a time when American companies, particularly in the technology area, are involved in existential struggles with companies in the rest of the world. Sometimes the job of our government should be to support our national champions rather than to try to break our national champions apart. So I think there are things we really do need to look at in the regulatory area. At the same time, at the same time, there are areas where there are new technologies coming forward where we don't have any regulatory framework at all, and we need to put in place an appropriate regulatory framework. Not because most businesses are bad. Most businesses want to do the right thing. But the problem when you don't have regulation is that the bad actors are able to cut prices, are able to cut product quality, are able to sell dangerous products and make it hard for the good actors to compete. So we need pro-market, smart regulation, and that's the way the debate should be framed, not the sterile debate about more or less. Larry, it's great to be with you here on Cambridge. Thank you so much for joining us. And that is Larry Summers of Harvard, former, of course, Secretary of the Treasury. Kaylee? All right. Bloomberg's David Weston and former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers, thank you for joining this special extended edition of Balance of Power. I'm Kaylee Lines alongside Joe Matthew, broadcasting live from New York on Bloomberg TV and radio on this election night. And as we wait for the first polls to begin closing just about 15 minutes from now, let's take a look back at some of the moments that have defined this historic 2024 election. For the democracy is still America's sacred cause is the most urgent question of our time. And it's what the 2024 election is all about. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. <laughs> this is a big one. And we have no choice because November 5th is right around the corner. Look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President Trump. Well, he's right. He did beat Medicare. He beat it to death. If I had not moved my head at that very last instant, the assassin's bullet would have perfectly hit its mark, and I would not be here tonight. I know there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life. But there's also a time and a place for new voices. You can We have inflation like very few people have ever seen before. Donald Trump left us the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. America will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer, and stronger than ever before. We are optimistic and excited about what we can do together. Joining us now is our signature political panel that has been with us for this entire Roller coaster. Rick Davis, Republican strategist and partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, Democratic analyst and political science professor at Iona University, as well as senior democracy fellow at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Thank you both for being with us as we're now just roughly 12 minutes away from the first poll closures in Indiana and Kentucky. It all comes down to tonight, Jeannie, and yet it remains too close to call. What will you be watching in the hours ahead? You know, I think one of the things we're going to be watching early on is to see, as we look at some of these counties in these early states, um, you know, can Kamala Harris perform or overperform as she needs to in some of these counties surrounding some of these urban areas. So if we look at some of the early states like North Carolina or Georgia, she has some work she's got to do there. She's got to overperform. And then by the same token, can Donald Trump do better than he did, for example, in Georgia in 2020? So those are the things we're going to be looking at. And obviously for him, we're going to be looking at some of the more rural counties. Rick, you've been through this a couple of times when it's been your own campaign. What are you watching this evening? And could it be true that we have a split here that has to go to the House of Representatives or beyond? Yeah, well, certainly that's the worst case scenario. Yeah. And if it happens, it'll be very extra constitutional in the sense that we've never experienced anything like that. So to speculate, let's wait till at least 2 a.m. to start that talk. <laughs> um, the reality is that uh, this is going to be a very, very close election numbers wise. Right. We know that in. 2020, uh, the election was won by basically 80,000 people in seven states. Um, we can expect that to be maybe even closer this time. The public polling tells us 
that it's actually a closer race now than it was then. So can 50,000 votes in seven states turn an election? That means there are going to be probably a couple counties in each one of these states that is going to drive the outcome of this election, either by, as Jeannie said, overperforming for Harris or underperforming for Trump or vice versa. And so we know where to look. We know where the exchanges are. We know where uh, Biden won in 20 and Trump won those same counties in uh, 2016. And so we think that's where the battleground really is. So it's not just seven states. It's probably a dozen counties. Well, and as we've been comparing this to 2020, this time around, Republicans have been more likely to vote early in a way they did not last cycle. There is also more Republicans registered, as Jeannie has been reminding us this week. What difference could that ultimately make, Rick? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, they start with a very good advantage. Um, in states like Arizona, they start with 300,000 more registered voters than the Democrats do, mm -hmm. double what they had two years ago. Uh, so these are, like, significant... Uh, structural improvements for the party. The similar registration um, uh, inputs in uh, Pennsylvania for that same period of time. So, so you know, I don't know what the Democrats were doing, but the Republicans got the hoodwink on them, you know, when it came to registration. And then when you do look at this early voting, Republicans are voting at the same levels as Democrats did in the early vote in 2020, which was historic. And it was a pandemic. So, yeah. you know, a lot has changed in these these last four years. And I would say, Going in to this election, just on the numbers, forget the campaigns and the candidates, uh, Republicans may have a numeric advantage going into these states. Fascinating. With more than 81 million Americans already voting, uh, Jeannie, they just started counting ballots at 7 o'clock this morning in Pennsylvania. Unless the polls are wrong, we're going to be waiting a while. We are going to be waiting a while. Um, you know, because I keep telling you guys, we need to do better at election administration. That's not going to happen today, though, so I'm going to have to get over it. Um, <laughs> you know, it should not take this long, but we are going to have to wait, I think, for some of these states. Florida, for instance, counts pretty fast. Yep. We've seen changes in Michigan. They'll likely go quicker than they did. Mm -hmm. But especially as we get out to places like Arizona, Pennsylvania, you know, those places are going to be slow. So we're going to be waiting. Um, you, you know, the reality is on this, this is our 60th presidential election in American history. We've had one that has gone to Congress. We're hoping that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. um, but given the numbers we're seeing, if these polls are correct, and that's a big if, if they're correct, something like that could happen tonight. And I think that's what has so many Americans on pins and needles here. Well, and if that does happen, it will be decided by the newly elected House of Representatives, which will also be decided tonight. All 435 <laughs> seats are up for grabs. Prevailing wisdom, Jeannie says Democrats will flip the House but lose the Senate. How could turnout, though, define whether or not that actually comes to fruition? You know, I, I think that is a distinct possibility. Um, you know, it's going to depend. So Republicans, they were able to take some key House races in 2022, and that's what won the House for the Republicans was in states, blue states like California, like New York. Now they are trying to defend those same states in places where Democrats should do very well at the top of the ticket. So turnout is going to be critically important in those states. We have about 22 uh, seats that are going to be up and competitive in the House tonight. And we're going to be watching all of those. And, and, you know, it's interesting because as we look at some of these state capitals around the country, you can see where a lot of what has happened in places like Albany and Sacramento has made it very, very tough mm -hmm. for Democrats. People are most unhappy in some of those state capitals, and they're taking it out at the top of the ticket in some of these House and Senate races. Rick, what will you be obsessed with when the first batch of polls close along the East Coast? We're going to be looking at North Carolina, looking at Georgia and other states. Yeah, for, uh, the two I'm going to be really honed in on is North Carolina and Georgia because, you know, it's path to 270 electoral votes for the presidential race. And so uh, the winner of those two uh, states, if it's the same candidate, whether it's Harris or Trump, has a unique and very distinct advantage going into the rest of the states. Um, uh, if you win those two states, you can lose Pennsylvania and still be president. If you don't, Pennsylvania is the one that then I'll hone in on because that'll be the game changer. Mm -hmm. So if you split those, uh, it's going to be uh, really incumbent on being able to run the table really for 
Kamala Harris particularly in the blue wall. Yep. But just within the next 10 minutes, we're going to get potentially preliminary results for parts of Indiana and Kentucky. They're the first to close at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And Kentucky in particular revealed some clues in 2016 as to the extent to which Donald Trump was resonating with Republicans. Could we get another sense of that this time around? Yeah, the first thing I would look in these early results is turnout. Um, you know, the biggest game in town right now is trying to figure out how many people are going to show up to vote. And every polling model has been predicated on someone's guess. Is it as much is 69% like it was in 2020, or is it more like 59% like it was closer to in 16? Mm -hmm. That has a significant in, uh, advantage for one candidate. The higher the turnout, the better for Donald Trump, uh, and the lower turnout, the better for Kamala Harris, because her votes turn out in higher percentages in lower, lower uh, uh, turnout elections. So uh, if Kentucky can sort of lead us in and say, okay, here's what we've got in Kentucky, yeah. um, you know, we can start making guesses as to what we think we're going to see in other states. A remaining moment here. What are you going to think or what will you say when Donald Trump declares victory early tonight? If that happens again, he's got a history of this. You know, if he actually wins, um, then I would say congratulations to him. And, you know, but of course, if he is declaring victory when the numbers don't support it, that is obviously deeply, deeply concerning. He's already today out on True Social just yeah. within the last hour suggesting there is cheating going on in Philadelphia, though mm -hmm. we have no evidence here at Bloomberg to support that allegation. Yeah, and we'll probably hear more reports like that as we make our way through it, but that's why we're here. You can trust Bloomberg with this tonight. And many thanks to our signature panel, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzana. We're going to have a long night together. They are with us for the duration. Bloomberg Politics contributors here at World Headquarters in New York. Coming up, the first polls begin closing in our next hour. We're going to have a lot more, Kaylee, on our extended edition of balance of power on this election night, 2024. Indeed, I'm Kaylee Lines alongside Joe Matthew and Rick and Jeannie, our signature political panel. Stay with us because we have much more ahead, including the first poll closures in just moments here on Bloomberg TV and radio. From the world of politics, to the world of business. This is Balance of Power. Live from New York. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to a special extended edition of Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Election night 2024 and the first set of polls are closing now in both parts of Kentucky and Indiana, with more than 80 million Americans having voted early in the races for president, the Senate and the House of Representatives. As the vote counting begins, we are joined this hour by Maria Teresa Kumar, president, CEO of Voto Latino, Bill Hoagland of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Andre Gillespie at Emory University and by our signature political panel, Bloomberg Politics contributors Rick Davis, and Jeannie Shanzano. With live coverage from our reporters in the field at the campaign's election night headquarters and in the swing states that will decide this election. And we begin live in Florida, where Donald Trump will be spending his evening and where we find Bloomberg's Felipe Marquez. Felipe, what's it feel like in the room? Well, I mean, we already have a small crowd in front of the stage it's going to be in later tonight. And it already feels like a full-on mega fashion show. There's lots and lots and lots of hats, red hats, black hats, everything in between. There are people in full-on mega regalia. Uh, we already have the stage lined up with a VIP section where I think you'll see most of his most important supporters. There's still a lot of room here. I think we're going to see it get much more packed. But we already kind of like seeing the most faithful lined up in the front of in the, in the front row. Well, a lot more to follow there, and we will get back to the headquarters, Felipe. Thank you so much as we turn to Howard University, where Kamala Harris is going to be tonight, her alma mater in the nation's capital. Bloomberg's Akela Gardner is standing by for the Democratic nominee. Akela? Hey, Joe. So this event has yet to get underway here. We are seeing some performers practicing behind me. You might hear some music behind me. If that's the case, I'm just going to keep going here. <laughs> but really what's happening across the country right now is polls are starting to close in the next couple of hours here. But something this campaign has touted really throughout the past couple months is the strength of their ground game. They have more than 2,000 staffers across the country and more than 350 field offices, particularly concentrated in those seven battleground states. And the states that most strategists are going to be 
be watching tonight. It's Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. They believe that is Harris's best path to victory and that one electoral college vote up for grabs in Nebraska. So those are the states that I'm going to be watching. But she has seen some weaknesses there. She's seen some unions not endorse her that typically endorse Democrats. But Warren Gaza has particularly been an issue in Michigan. So we're going to really have to see if she pulls through with all three of those blue wall states. All right, Bloomberg's Akela Gardner at Howard University, where it certainly is getting louder. Thank you so much for joining us. This is 6 p.m. Eastern time now. Futures have begun trading on this election night. So joining us now with a check of the markets is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail. Well, Kaylee, after a very robust rally for stocks at S&P 500, closing up by more than 1% right now, as is typical on the open of U.S. futures for a variety of markets, including the S&P 500, they're up just slightly. We're not seeing a lot of movement for stocks, bonds, or other commodities. And what investors really want, well, that's certainty. And on a night like tonight, on Election Day, night 2024, that is a winner of the U.S. presidential election. If, as the results start to come in, there's a clear uh, sense that there is going to be a winner today, tonight, uh, you'll probably see a bit of a risk on rally. On the other hand, if there is uh, uncertainty or even the possibility of a contested election, that's when you could see a negative reaction for stocks. Now, one strategy just today was telling me bonds know all, so keep an eye on bonds. On the day bonds were mixed, that's a definite little bit of a, a hedging on the part of the market. Speaking of hedging, we've been watching that volatility index or the VIX. Interestingly, just recently hitting year-to-date highs outside of the Japanese yen unwind, carry trade unwind, but now coming off of those levels. So whether investors were outright buying volatility for the idea of the uncertainty or they were hedging uncertainty, investors a little bit less worried, suggesting that maybe there will, in fact, be a winner of the U.S. presidential election tonight. What a concept. Abigail, thank you. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle with the markets that will become a bigger part of the story as we make our way through this election night. Let's bring in now our reporter panel, Bloomberg's <laughs> Wendy Benjaminson and Bloomberg's Megan Scully are joining us from the nation's capital as they prepare to cover whatever happens this evening. It's great to see you both, uh, Wendy and Megan. What's going through your mind right now, Wendy? As we wait for results to come in, you and I have been talking about this for over a year. The early vote has emerged yes, as have. a fascinating component of this story post-pandemic. And the contrasts that we've seen from these candidates are the fact of the matter is it's too tight to call and no one knows what is about to happen. Exactly. And I will quote our friends at Politico who had the great headline, everybody take a Xanax, uh. you know, which is we just don't know how this is going to turn out. Um, this is a 50-50 race. Um, you know, through the night, we're going to hear Trump is pulling ahead in this state or Harris is pulling ahead in this state. And that just means they open boxes from conservative or liberal counties. So it's going to be days. And I think we just all need to be very, very very patient, which you and I, Joe, are not very good at. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Speak for yourself, Wendy and Joe. I'm feeling pretty patient this evening. Just kidding. I don't think Long anyone ball, actually yeah. is. And patience may be required, especially to figure out who won control of the House. And we're hearing optimism projected from both camps on that. Just earlier today, we spoke with Democratic Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, chair of the DCCC, and Michael Watley, chair of the RNC. And this is what they had to say about their confidence this election day. Republicans were really poised to have a fantastic day. When you look at voter registration numbers, you look at the early vote, the absentee uh, ballot requests and returns, uh, all of that put the Republicans in a great position to win. And in the House, Republicans have been in charge and they've been incapable of governing. So people want to see governance work in these important districts all across the country. We have great candidates. We have the resources to get their message out. We've been talking to voters and all that is a great reason why we'll take back the majority. So, Megan, to bring you in here as you lead our congressional coverage as we figure out who has the majority. It's also a question of the size of the majority and how many pickups either party might be able to get tonight. 
So right now, there just needs to be a four-seat pickup by Democrats to switch the majority in the House and, and for them to claim it. What's interesting is that Suzanne Delbeni, who you just had on, on screen there, um, spent the weekend in the heartland. Mm -hmm. She was in Omaha and she was in Iowa, where there are competitive seats, not exactly states where you associate a Democrats, you know, potentially winning seats. But those three seats are key to Democrats claiming the majority. Well, give us a sense of what your expectations are here, Megan, because it does appear that it will take California to actually answer the question of who controls the House. So we could be in for days here, right? We certainly could. There is the, the issue of California and the absentee ballots coming in and, and there being kind of a prolonged period there that if there if these races, these five competitive House races in Southern California are close, mm -hmm. we could be looking at a multi-day exercise here. We may find out who the next president is before we find out who has control of the House. Of course, that depends on what happens in the rest of the country. And there are a lot of uh, competitive races, even on the East Coast, in, in New York, um, in uh, North Carolina, and in Virginia, as well as two in Pennsylvania. So we might have some indication early on whether we're looking at a red sweep or a blue sweep here. Well, we're starting to get initial results, very early results coming in from the two states that have already seen polls close, Wendy. That would be Indiana and Kentucky, with just 2 percent of the votes counted in Kentucky right now. Donald Trump is in the lead with 63 percent of that very early vote in uh, Indiana. He has 71 and a half percent of the vote, although that's just 9,000 votes at this time. So with all that said, remind us of how we should watch the figures come in this evening and what, if any, mirage effect we should be looking for. Well, mirage effect is absolutely right, Kaylee. These are the early votes. These are the people who came in and voted over the last, what, two weeks, three weeks or a month who have voted. Also remember that both Indiana and Kentucky are very red states. Um, there was no question that Donald Trump is probably, well, I shouldn't say no question. It's, it's very likely that Donald Trump will carry both Indiana and Kentucky. Kentucky is home of Mitch McConnell, the Senate uh, leader. Indiana, the home of Mike Pence. These are very conservative states. Um, so it's not a huge surprise that he is that ahead. But they, please remember that when you're looking at California or New York, city at least, um, you know, places that you know are blue, um, you know, reliably blue areas, those, when that early vote comes in, Kamala Harris is going to be well ahead. So just be patient, as I said before, and let the count happen over tonight, probably tomorrow, and maybe even Thursday, um, before all those early votes and mail-in ballots are counted, and we know what really happened. Megan, it does appear that the Senate, the wide expectation is, at least, that the Senate may tilt Republican with a very difficult map facing Democrats tonight. We've got some real close to call races in the blue wall states, just like we are seeing between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. So to what extent will the presidential election play into what happens in the Senate? Well, particularly in the blue wall, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, um, and in Michigan, we have hotly contested seats. In two of those states, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, you have incumbents who are fighting for their political lives. And in Michigan, you have an open Senate seat. So it will be interesting to see which races we get called first here. If we get a call for Bob Casey winning in Pennsylvania, that certainly doesn't mean that Kamala Harris will win in Pennsylvania. But it is a good indication of where the electorate may be headed. Same thing goes for David McCormick. If, if he were to win the Republican candidate and former CEO of Bridgewater Associates, if he were to pull out a victory in Pennsylvania, that does bode well for Donald Trump. All right, Bloomberg's Megan Scully and Wendy Benjaminson, thank you both so much for joining. And we want to go now to one of the battleground states where there is a Senate race and that ultimately could have a role in deciding the presidential one, Arizona. Joining us live from Phoenix is Bloomberg's Brendan Case. Uh, Brendan, obviously Arizona has a later polling time just due to its geographic location, so we still have a few hours to go here. But what's the feeling like on the ground? That's exactly right. There's another three hours until until polls close. It seems as though the day has gone more or less smoothly so far. Uh, polls will close at 9 p.m. Eastern time. An hour after that, we'll get our first results from Maricopa County. 
Now, Maricopa is Arizona's largest county by far. It contains Phoenix, Scottsdale, accounts for more than half of the state's voters. And what we'll be seeing in that initial initial information drop is most of the early voting. Uh, Arizona is a state where a lot of people vote by mail, and the, the initial tally will include uh, something on the order of 1.1 million, 1.2 million votes, according to county officials. That's likely to be about 55 percent or so of all votes cast in, in the county. And they'll be reporting additional results through the night, uh, you know, from other counties throughout the state and on into tomorrow. Uh, now, what are we what what are these numbers likely to tell us? Well, county officials are very cautious about saying that it probably won't be possible to tell a winner early on. And they're saying that it could take a day, two days, maybe more before. Uh, before media organizations start to feel comfortable enough to, to declare a winner. Uh, Arizona, of course, leans Republican. Uh, Joe Biden's eked out an absolute squeaker of a victory in 2020 with a margin of only about 10,000 votes, a little bit more. Uh, Trump in the latest New York Times polling average was up by about three percentage points. That was one of the largest gaps in the in the seven swing states. Uh, but those are polls. This is the vote, and 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 most people are expecting a pretty a pretty close race. Uh, now, the presidential campaign is is not the only one. You mentioned the the Senate race, and and in that race, the Democrat Ruben Gallego appears to have about a five point lead over the Republican Carrie Lake, who's a a big Trump supporter, a big diehard MAGA fan. Uh, she says the race is actually a little bit closer. That's a big watch item. Yep. Also on the ballot is abortion. There's a referendum about whether to guarantee reproductive rights, obviously a big national issue. That's going to have an effect here as well. It's one of the big themes that people talk about when you, when you, when you talk with voters. All right. With The View from Phoenix, fascinating roundup. Bloomberg's Brendan Case. Thank you so much, Brendan. We're going to be talking a lot more about these races a little bit later on tonight in Battleground, Arizona. And coming up, we'll have a closer look at Florida and Texas with our Bloomberg reporters in the field tonight. Special election night coverage on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and radio. Welcome back to an extended election night special of Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Kaylee Lines, live from New York alongside Joe Matthew as we broadcast live on Bloomberg Television and Radio with coverage across the country on this election night, including in Miami, Florida, where we turn to Bloomberg's Anna Kaiser. Anna, obviously Florida, a state that is expected to go red, but a Senate race that we are watching and, of course, also the state in which Donald Trump is spending his evening. Yeah, that's right. We've got Donald Trump in Palm Beach, and uh, we are watching a Senate race here in Florida. Donald Trump has been polling to win pretty easily here, but uh, Rick Scott is facing a closer than expected challenger in Debbie Mercosell Powell. She is a Democrat from here in Miami. There are some polls that have her, you know, within one or two points of him. It's kind of a long shot for Democrats in, in Florida, um, but it is potentially a, a, a gain that Democrats can make here. Fascinating. Bloomberg's Anna Kaiser, thank you so much. As we turn out of the state of Texas and our Texas bureau chief joining us live from Dallas, Julie Fine. The reason we're talking Texas largely, Julie, is because of the Senate race there that was not supposed to be on the menu tonight. But Ted Cruz may actually be in for a legitimate challenge by Colin Allred. Where is this race? Well, right now, it is a challenging race for Senator Ted Cruz. He is home in Houston tonight. I am told by his campaign that he has been doing radio all day. He had three events yesterday in the state of Texas, all in suburban areas. That is where he needs to do very well. And then Congressman Colin Allred, the challenger, is home in Dallas tonight. He did his radio and in television interviews yesterday trying to get those last minute votes. And today he stopped by a phone bank and he knocked on some doors. Now, Joe, you said this race is a bit of a challenge. Well, this is a reliably red state. 
But the polls have this race at about three points. And if you remember back in 2018, Texas Senator Ted Cruz had a very tough race against Beto O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. This is one his campaign tells me that he is taking very seriously. Colin Allred, quite a story here in Dallas when he knocked off a popular Republican congressman in 2018, hoping to do that again tonight. Both candidates, again, in their hometowns. They have events tonight as they wait to see what happens with all of these votes. Joe and Kaylee. All right, Bloomberg's Texas Bureau Chief, Julie Fine, thank you so much. Texas, of course, a border state, and the border and immigration, one of the primary issues in this campaign. Here's a piece of how Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have addressed this topic over the course of the election. We are going to start the largest mass deportation in the history of our country because we have no choice. It's not sustainable. And we are going to start with violent criminals, and we're going to start then with criminals. And our local police is going to work with us because they know everything about the people. They know their names. They know everything about them. I am going to bring forward that bipartisan bill to further strengthen and secure our border. Yes, I am. But and I'm going to work across the aisle to pass com a comprehensive bill that deals with a broken immigration system. Joining us now for more on the issue of immigration and the Latino vote in this election is Maria Teresa Kumar. She is president and CEO of Vote Out Latino. Maria Teresa, thank you so much for being here. We have heard consistently throughout this cycle that next to the economy, immigration is the number one issue for Latino voters especially. How have the candidates' cases being made on this issue resonated with them? You know, it's really interesting. We were seeing some neck to neck be, uh, between Trump and Kamala Harris prior to the comedian saying those disgraceful comments at Madison Square Garden. Uh, once that happened, what we've seen is just a ricochet in the Latino community coming together and feeling almost a reminder of what it was under, under Donald Trump. And I was I will share with you, I was in Pennsylvania this past weekend door knocking and people were saying that they had they weren't sure if they were going to vote. They were on the fence. But after the Madison Square Garden comments, they were all of a sudden not only energized, but they were coming out in full force. I do think, though, that if Kamala Harris is the, you know, is the person that is uh, elected to be president, she is going to have to figure out how to navigate the undocumented community that's been here for 10, 20, 30 years who are looking for some sort of relief to come out of the shadows. And that is where the majority of Americans are also aligned with. And she will have to have a separate conversation of what's happening at the border and the south of our border. I do think that it is time for us to have an honest conversation with fellow Americans and recognizing that we have not had a Latin American policy for the last 45 years. And as a result, we have left it vulnerable to foreign interference by uh, massive investments by both China and Russia. And increasingly destabilized governments that were once solidly democratic are increasingly vulnerable to, uh, to other policies, as we're seeing in, in Venezuela and we're also seeing in, uh, in Ecuador and Peru. Maria Teresa, you mentioned Madison Square Garden. I want to get to the bottom of this with you a little bit because that was a remarkable news cycle over the course of that week, starting with the original offending joke. Then what Joe Biden said, using the word garbage, seemed to turn this around. By the end of the week, Donald Trump's driving around in a dump truck, and the word garbage has taken on new meaning somehow in this campaign. It is not lost on us that Kamala Harris was in two majority Latino cities in Pennsylvania in her closing day, Allentown and Reading. What is the impact, if any, of this whole saga? Well, I will share with you. It was an unfortunate uh, conversation that the President Biden had. He actually had it on a Voto Latino Zoom call where we he were sure trying did. to get people excited and geared up. And so it was an unforced error. But I also think the fact that Kamala Harris has been spending time in Reading and Lehigh and Allentown is testament that she recognizes the Latino vote is critical for her in Pennsylvania. It's also critical for her in Nevada and Georgia and North Carolina. And she made it very clear that what the president said was his comments, not hers. And what she's been able to do is distinguish herself from uh, from his, uh, you know, from the president. I do think, though, that what we saw with the Madison Square Garden comments was that it did unify the Latino community. I will share with you, Voto Latino, we work with artists all the time. We have been trying to engage Bad Bunny for a very long time. And he was always very clear with us saying this is politics in the 48 states. It's not of my concern. I'm very interested in Puerto Rico. The moment that those 
those comments landed with Bad Bunny, it changed the equation. Not so much because it was Bad Bunny, but because Bad Bunny has an audience that are low information, low propensity voters, people that were tuned out to the election all of a sudden tuned in. And he gave them a very clear indicator that there is someone on the ballot that was not respecting them. Mm -hmm. And there was another person on the ballot that perhaps if elected, she could work with them. It would be incredible to consider Bad Bunny having a larger influence on the outcome of this election than, say, Taylor Swift or Beyonce, it's Maria Theresa. <laughs> well, certainly we have seen the force of celebrity in action, uh, helping reinforce the messages of both candidates, frankly, given the promises they have made on the campaign trail. Kamala Harris to sign bipartisan legislation initially proposed uh, earlier on in this Congress. Donald Trump talking about mass deportation. What is really on the line tonight for people who have immigrated or migrated to this country? Well, I think part of it, not just on the line for the folks that have immigrated and have become naturalized citizens like myself, but every single American. I do think that the vote that we have tonight, who we determine it holds the keys to the White House, is also going to map out what American leadership looks locally and abroad. One of the things that I always say is that our multicultural superpower for our democracy is the fact that we come from different places. That is our multiculturalism that makes us the envy of the world. And it should be, you know, I always say, don't take my word for it. The fact that the Russians in 2016 and 2020 have tried to use divisiveness, have tried to use propaganda around race to divide Americans because they recognize that that is our Achilles heel. But if we come together and we register, we vote, we participate in our democracy as a multicultural unit, then we are unstoppable here in a Abroad. And I am really, you know, there's, it's been a tough four years trying to get everybody mobilized and engaged. But I do have to say that there has been an incredible shift in the last 15 days. I've traveled on the ground in Nevada. I've been in Arizona. I've been in California, even Boston. And the energy that we're seeing around the country is far different than we saw even six, seven months ago. Okay. And I think it's because we're people are waking up and recognizing that democracy is far more important than party. And we will see with the long lines how that translates. Yeah. If you ask me what I'm looking at, mm -hmm. in 2020, 52% of women voted on election day. Okay. If we see a markup of 53 or 54% of women voting on election day, that's a landslide. And I do think that we're going to see a lot of women coming together in unison, regardless of their of their party and okay. regardless of their ethnicity, to vote for democracy first we'll and if, vote for their daughters. We'll see if we're using the word landslide in one direction or the other later on. Maria Teresa Kumar, great to see you. President CEO, Voto Latino, playing a major role in this campaign. And coming up, we'll break down the candidates' proposed economic policies with Bill Hoagland from the Bipartisan Policy Center on a special night here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Thank you. I'm a believer in tariff. Giant tariffs. It's the most beautiful word there is. Tariff. We will create what I call an opportunity economy. An opportunity economy. We will build. Yes, what I call an opportunity economy. I want to cut taxes on Americans while putting tariffs on China and foreign countries. Ours that is focused on bringing down the cost of living for working families, investing in small businesses and entrepreneurs. I will support a tax credit for family caregivers who take care of a parent or a loved one. I will be laser focused on creating opportunities for the middle class that advance their economic security, stability, and dignity. Just some of the economic policy ideas that have been proposed by Kamala Harris and Donald Trump on the campaign trail. We could play them all night. Joining us now for a closer look is Bill Hoagland, Senior Vice President at the Bipartisan Policy Center, a veteran of the U.S. Senate. Bill, it's great to see you. Happy Election Day. Which candidate, hey, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, would be at greater mercy of Congress based on their economic proposals? Um, let, let me just say that uh, I think for both of them, there'll be challenges regardless of who wins mm. uh, tonight and the makeup of the Congress. Uh, we have to, first of all, finish up this year's uh, Congress, the 117th <laughs> Congress. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, when they come back a week from today, they only have about 20 days uh, to basically fund the government uh, for the fiscal year that we're in. 
Uh, I'm going to, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb here to say they're not going to be able to do that, and so they're going to end up with another continuing resolution well into next year after the inauguration of the new president and the new Congress coming in. So I just want to point out that uh, for talking about all these things uh, either candidate's going to do, uh, they've got some real fixed cost, if you like, things they have to do, and that is to keep government funding. So they'll have a continuing resolution. And I would point out, long before we get to implementing some of the proposals that they have advanced, uh, we're going to hit the statutory debt limit, something yeah. that uh, always, always creates problems. That will come early, too. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we haven't, we'll be funding the fiscal year 26. So I just want to make it clear that regardless of who wins and regardless of the makeup of the Congress, uh, there's some big challenges ahead before we even get to the tax bills that uh, includes a number of the opportunity uh, suggestions or the president's uh, tariffs proposals. It's going to be uh, uh, an interesting set of issues that they're going to have to deal with uh, well before getting to the bigger proposals that are on the campaign that they're, uh, that they're advancing. Well, Bill, it's, it's an excellent point, and certainly we have seen great difficulty in getting these kind of spending-oriented things through both chambers of Congress. So talk us through how the size of the majority won tonight for either party, party will ultimately matter. What kind of margin would be needed to make this process easy? Well, that's a very good question, Katie. Uh, recall that when 2017, when uh, uh, President Bush won, uh, and he came in with a, uh, both a Republican Senate and a Republican uh, House. The margin in the House was over 40, uh, 40 Republicans, and in the Senate it was about six. Uh, so he had a good margin there. Uh, I don't know. I'm not making any predictions. But I think based upon everything I'm reading, and I'm not a political uh, pundit in this area, I would say that we're going to have a very, very close margins again, but it's going to be a lot less than what he had in 2017. So let's, let's take the scenario that should there be a sweep, should Republic, should the president, the former President Trump win, yeah. should Republicans control the Senate and the House, then I would expect uh, uh, an old process that I'm somewhat familiar with is called the, the budget resolution reconciliation process. Uh, That's what they did in 2017. They could pass a budget resolution that included a reconciliation instruction to do away with the Affordable Care Act uh, and that that uh, avoided the 60-vote hurdle. So if it's a sweep, you can be certain. I, I hear that we have a, a, a secret plan, I believe, between the Speaker and uh, Mr. Trump has indicated. Well, that secret plan is not exactly a big secret to me. Hmm. It is, if you have a sweep, you will do a budget resolution that sets up a reconciliation instruction that then allows you to move forward with your tax bill and avoid the 60-vote hurdle huh. in the Senate. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a split Congress... Uh, regardless of who's at the White House, then we're going to have a situation, no surprise, coming from the Bipartisan Policy Center. We're going to have to have negotiations. We're going to have to have compromise. And that's yeah. going to be uh, something that this uh, town is not very familiar with <laughs> recently, and that creates some of the delays that you talked about, Katie, and getting, getting work done quickly. So Bill knows what the secret is this whole time. I guess it's not tele-town <laughs> halls. Bill, take us to school on the map. As a Senate veteran, there is a narrative in Washington that Republicans will take control of the Senate because of the timing of this election. Do you believe in it? Well, in, in fairness and in full disclosure, I worked for Republicans when I was in the United States Senate staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for Senator uh, Dole, Senator Baker, Senator Domenici, and uh, the, the, I guess the old, the old class of uh, Republicans. Uh, and uh, I do think that... Uh, uh, I will go. I will say that it looks like the Republicans will take, uh, will win. Uh, I will go out on a limb on that far tonight. Yeah. Uh, but again, the margin will be very small, and uh, it doesn't take very much when you have a when you have a margin of one or two, a couple, just as John McCain was that stopped the uh, repeal of the Affordable Care Act back in 2017. It doesn't take much uh, of a of one or two senators to, to uh, uh, throw a. a monkey wrench in the wheels, if you like, yeah. going forward. So, yes, it, but it, it will be close on the margin. So I, I'm anticipating uh, a lot of uh, hard work ahead for whoever the president is and whoever uh, controls the Congress. Well, financial markets 
might take that as good news, Bill. They kind of like the idea of divided government. But would you have a word of warning for our audience here on Bloomberg TV and radio about the difficulty that might bring or the prospects of really ad addressing the deficit of the United States, no matter who wins this evening? Well, it, clearly the, the, the degree of polarization that we have in our politics today, unless coming out of this election we settle down and we decide, yes, we have to work together to get things done, then I can see for the markets out there to be a little bit concerned about raising the statutory debt limit. Uh, that uh, The last thing we want and, and should never anticipate and do not want to have happen is for the United States government to default. But if you have a continue that polarization and if you don't do it through a, a mechanism that avoids the 60 vote for hurdle in the Senate, then you have some you're going to move us up once again right up to the breaking point and that will create uncertainty and uh, for the markets going forward. And again, for not for the debt limit, but for just for funding government, once again, uh, uh, if we can't seem to get together and compromise on some of these issues, we will end up with a, a potential of a government shutdown in addition to the potential of defaulting on our on our debt. So uh, I, I don't want to be a doomer here. I <laughs> want to be positive that things are going to go a, a, swimmingly, if you like, but I do think that there are real risks uh, going forward to volatility uh, early on in the next Congress. All right, Bill Hoagland, bringing us all a reality check on this election night. Senior Vice President of the Bipartisan Policy Center, thank you so much for joining. Coming up, we'll shine a spotlight on Georgia, a look at the battleground state that has been a focus for both candidates with Andre Gillespie, political science professor at Emory University, straight ahead on this special election edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Thanks for being with us on special election night coverage, an extended edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines here at World Headquarters in New York as we're buckling in for the big one here. Kaylee, we've had our first set of polls closing parts of Kentucky and Indiana, but the big stuff starts at 7 p.m. Eastern time when we carry on with our colleagues from Bloomberg Surveillance. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have extended coverage all night long. And at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we'll get a very important poll closure. Yeah. The state of Georgia That's that carries right. with it 16 electoral votes and one of the crucial battlegrounds we will be watching this evening. Joining us now is uh, Bloomberg's Atlanta Bureau Chief Brett Pulley. Speaking of Georgia, Brett, it's great to have you with us this evening. Your thoughts as we get down to actual vote counting and what you're hearing on the ground on this election day. Bring us up to date. No, that's right. We are less than 20 minutes away from the polls officially closing here in Georgia. And uh, as you indicated, it looks like that of the key battleground states, Georgia could be the first one where we have some real results. The Secretary of State has said that by 8 o'clock tonight, one hour after the polls close, all of the early votes will be in, will be counted. So that's about 4 million votes. They were expecting about another 1 million today. And the Secretary of State has said that those will be counted before the evening mm -hmm. is over. So it looks like we could know something out of the state of Georgia tonight. One of the things that I think they like to avoid clearly is the kind of result that we had in 2020, of course, when it took more than a week it, uh -huh. uh, due to the need to hand count votes. Yeah. And, uh, of course, that ended with... Uh, at that time, President Trump losing by about a margin of about 11,000 votes. So they're hoping that they don't have that kind of result uh, this time. And, and the uh, Secretary of State has really been touting the efficiency of, of his office and of the effort that they have this year. Reminding us of the importance that Georgia will play in this election. Bloomberg's Brett Pulley. Thank you so much, Brett. As we turn now to Andre Gillespie for a closer look here, a political science professor at Emory University. Welcome back, Professor. Great to have you tonight as part of our coverage on Bloomberg TV and radio. The Harris campaign saying out loud it expects near complete results tonight from Michigan, North Carolina, and yes, Georgia. What do you expect to learn by tomorrow morning? 
Um, I expect that you should have a pretty clear sense of the direction of this race. If we're looking at another uh, margin of 12,000 votes or 10 to 20,000 votes, um, it may take a little bit longer to count votes because absentee votes and overseas and military votes will have to be counted. But if the margin is a little bit larger, I think we should have some clear results uh, you know, by late this evening during the overnight period at the latest. Mm -hmm. Well, so as as we consider what will happen overnight, what areas will you be watching, Andra? Obviously, you know Georgia incredibly well. What counties should we be watching? Where in the state will give us signs of how it ultimately is going to go? Well, you have to pay attention to the large metro Atlanta counties. Uh, they're the biggest counties, so that's where a trove of votes are going to come from, particularly Democratic votes. But they also tend to be the ones that take the longest to count. So DeKalb and Fulton counties are usually the ones that we're paying attention to. Fulton County has a reputation for taking longer. Um, it's been the target of um, election reforms that some people argue are suppressive, so I expect that they're going to try to be fast and efficient as they get those votes count. But when you're having to count hundreds of thousands of votes, as is going to be the case in DeKalb and Fulton and Cobb and Gwinnett counties, you should expect that those are going to be the last to, uh, to, be, to be added to uh, the vote totals. And as we consider what's propelling voters to the polls in this election, Georgia, obviously a state with more restrictive abortion law, Andra, and I wonder what role you expect that to play this evening. Well, since the Dobbs decision, we have seen abortion increase in salience for Democrats across the country. There's no reason to believe that that isn't true here in Georgia. And so I think the questions that we're going to see is whether or not that actually helped to drive up turnout amongst young female voters um, and whether or not we're going to see higher turnout and a significant shift towards Kamala Harris there. And then I think the other question is whether or not abortion is going to have uh, the same impact in uh, the northern metro suburbs among college-educated white women that say COVID had in 2020. Now, those north metro counties like Cobb and Gwinnett were already tilting uh, Democratic. Uh, so we want to see if they continue to be Democratic and if by how much. And so then the other thing is that uh, the gender gap in Georgia tends to be a little bit more narrow than it is nationally. Um, and so we want to see tonight whether or not that gender gap is, in fact, bigger. And then I think the question to determine after the fact is how much abortion actually influenced uh, the increase in the size of that gender gap. Well, gender is certainly one of the ways demographically we will be looking at the vote total tonight. Another is a breakdown by race. Andra, Georgia, of course, has one of the highest black populations of any state in the country. So what could the black vote tell us in Georgia that could show us a picture, a capture uh, what that vote is looking like nationally? Well, there are two different questions. So first, it's a question of the size of the African-American electorate. In early voting, African-American turnout wasn't exactly uh, the same as white turnout. So whites turned out at a much higher rate than African-Americans did. So a big question today is, um, did African-Americans show up to vote on Election Day? And that's going to be particularly true in majority black counties, both um, in other parts of the state and more rural parts of the state, but also in metro Atlanta, where voter turnout was robust, but it didn't match the levels of some of the uh, uh, Republican congressional districts that are in ex-urban Atlanta, for instance. Um, and so once we know what turnout is, then we'll need to see what the split in the vote is. Um, Donald Trump in the last poll got about 13% of the vote, which if we can fit, uh, factor in the margin of error would suggest that he's probably uh, in the range of what his performance was in 2020, sometimes belying some of uh, the mm. boasts that he was going to increase black voter turnout. But I think the question is, uh, did Kamala Harris consolidate the African-American vote? Because in those last polls leading up to the election, even in Georgia polls, uh, you know, she wasn't uh, getting 90 percent of the African-American vote. So I think yeah. the question is, African-American voters come home. I think probably the story and the trajectory is likely that they did. And anybody who was expressing doubts about voting for her either changed their mind or they may not have decided to vote in this election at all. All right, Andre Gillespie, political science professor at Emory University, thank you so much. Coming up, our signature political panel shares their final thoughts before polls begin to close. They've already partially closed in Indiana and Kentucky. We have much more ahead on this special election edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Look, it, the ball's in our hand. All we have to do is get out the vote tomorrow. You get out the vote, they can't do anything about it. We win. We're the party of common sense. If you give me a chance to fight on your behalf as president, 
There is nothing in the world that will stand in my way. I will spend every day on your behalf working on my to-do list. Donald Trump, Kamala Harris making their final campaign pitches last night in dueling rallies. Trump in Michigan. Harris also in Michigan. Back with us now, our signature panel, Rick Davis, Stone Court Capital partner. Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, senior democracy fellow at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Great to have you both with us. We get another set of polls closing 10 minutes from now, the state of Georgia. What's going to happen, Jeannie? Yeah, I think we are all waiting. For me, I'm waiting to see those big counties around yeah. Atlanta. They have like 40% of the vote in Georgia. And Kamala Harris, if she has a hope of repeating what Joe Biden did very narrowly in 2020, she's going to have to overperform in those counties. So that's what I'm looking for. And then, of course, Donald Trump, likewise, is going to have to make that up in yeah. the rural counties. So red state, largely, uh, Rick, though, they have two Democratic senators. What does it mean for Kamala Harris? Yeah, look, I think it means she's got a chance. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, we remember those elections. Uh, candidates matter. That's right. And so regardless of the demographics, unless you have a good candidate, you, you can't win a race. And so I agree with Jeannie. I think that, you know, DeKalb, uh, For uh, Forsyth and Cherokee counties for Republicans, uh, you know, it's it's going to be all about how many people are turning out, what percentage is uh, Kamala Harris going to get the percentage of black vote that she really needs sure. to try and compete in that state? Uh, there have been a lot of questions as to whether she's really galvanized the black vote the way, uh, frankly, uh, her predecessor in the presidency right now, uh, Joe Biden, did in 2020. Uh, historic levels of black vote for him, yeah. uh, which helped turn that state. So uh, there's a lot to look at inside these counties as they start to report. Just quickly, does Donald Trump's feud with Brian Kemp, the governor, matter in this campaign? You know, it probably mattered early on, right? At a period of time before they kind of made up, yes, right. uh, you know, they were they were at it pretty hard. Of course, he supported candidate against uh, his reelection, the governor's reelection. So there were a lot of ill feelings with the staffs, especially in the organization. Uh, the governor controls the get out the vote organization in yes. Georgia. Donald Trump is completely dependent upon that. <laughs> and so uh, I know what's going to happen, right? Uh, you know, Donald Trump's going to say, I did it in spite of him if he wins. Interesting. And he's going to blame the governor if he loses. Let's broaden things out a little bit here, Jeannie. As you look up and down the East Coast, what are the paths or the path that could make this an early night? You know, I think the path would be the first thing we look for is to see, does either one of them take both Georgia and North Carolina? Yeah. In the last several elections, the swing states all break the same way, or the vast majority. So that would tell you so that there are national implications. There are national implications, movement. yeah. And so I think that's the first thing to look at. Of course, Pennsylvania is the big prize here. Um, and it becomes more important for, like, Kamala Harris, if Donald Trump keeps Georgia or takes Georgia back and gets North Carolina. And I think it's important to remember, there wasn't that long ago when we didn't even think North Carolina was a swing state. So yeah, the fact right. that the Democrats That's have true. put that in play and Donald Trump is spending time there in the last few days is really telling to how she was able to expand that map. You're right. It was not on the list of a lot of swing states nope. uh, at the beginning of this campaign. Rick, we're not talking too much about gubernatorial races tonight, but there's one that has my attention in New England. The race in New Hampshire, where Kelly Ayotte had a big lead in this thing and just constant hammering on the issue of abortion has tightened this up a lot. Will that race give us an early indication of what might follow later in the evening? I think this is a pretty singular race. Yeah. I mean, New Hampshire is really not in play. I think if Trump had had his way, he would have probably tried to put it in play. And of mm -hmm. course, they were talking big about that when Biden was still the candidate for the Democrats. Kelly Ayotte, uh, former senator, great yes. friend of John McCain's, uh, coming back from a, a layoff, you know, <laughs> after losing the Senate race in 16. And so uh, the reality is uh, this is a pretty much of a one-off race. I don't think it has implications nationally, but it is a race that has tightened up in recent weeks and I think really portends some of the Democratic momentum yes. that has been national. The other governor's race that'll be key in the early going is North Carolina. That's a lot of right. folks thought that Donald Trump lost the state the day that Mark Robinson, the lieutenant governor's scandal, broke out. How does it feel now? Um, it, it's it's definitely lost it to Rick's earlier point. Candidates matter an awful lot. And Mark Robinson has been what we've seen, for instance, Carrie Lake and what we saw in 2022 when yeah. Donald Trump was supporting these candidates who really were particularly problematic. We saw it across the country. And so the, once again with Mark Robinson, we see that. So that is a problem. Um, does it impact, the, you know, as we look at the presidential race, does that impact? We still don't know yet. That's for sure. Yeah. Are you both gaming for a late night? Yes? 
I'm probably a little earlier than Jeannie is. Yeah. We've been yeah. talking about like when we think the calls will be made. Right. Uh, I think it's sort of um, a tree falling. It either falls to the left or the right. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing in between. And so, and so if the tree falls to the right, I think it'll be at an early need. But you're breaking out the cots, Jeannie. Is that right? Yeah, and I don't want to leave you guys. So, I'm, I, <laughs> no. Joe, I'm saying no. it's going to go longer. Yeah. We're going nowhere. <laughs> this is We're here for the duration one way or the other with our colleagues Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, our signature panel. They're in as well because we're just getting getting started on Bloomberg TV and radio and we thank you for spending part of your election night with us right here on Bloomberg.